Good morning, guys. Um, I want to talk to you about something that's kind of been on my heart and that's been bothering me. Do you remember the, the snake that we brought in here the other day? Um, remember it fell, it was climbing up the wall outside and it fell down on one of the teachers yeah. and she got really scared. Today, when I came in, there was a another juvenile rat snake exactly like the one that we saw and he was on a sticky like on a sticky pad so someone put out a sticky pad but it's bothering me because I don't think everybody understands that that snakes part of our environment here at Unity Grove and it's helpful for us does anybody know what rat snakes do what can they do Jacob they can eat rats and rodents that can be harmful to the school's environment and why would that be a problem? Why would rodents be a problem at a school? Christian? Um, it could like, the rats could go into the school and rodents and they could like dirty the school and they could go in the cafeteria and like, like eat the food and stuff. And like, they could also um, bother us while we're trying to study and learn and trying to do classwork and stuff. Absolutely. Right, absolutely. So I've been thinking guys, that we probably need to let people know. I don't know who put the sticky trap out, but we probably need to let people know around here how beneficial those rat snakes can be. What do you guys think? Yeah. Okay, so I was thinking that um, we might embark on a little adventure of our own and maybe educate some people around here about the environment that we have here at Unity Grove. What do you think about that? Yeah. Okay. In this unit, the kids are learning about um, what's in their schoolyard and they are uh, you know, exploring that through writing, social studies, science, uh, and then the end product is a, an ebook, which will also be a hard copy in our library. Mrs. Hartfield is one of the most effective special education teachers I've ever met. She is first and foremost very student-centered. She loves her kids unconditionally. She would do anything in her power to make them successful. And she's also a teacher leader. She helps other special ed teachers and teachers in general to um, incorporate some of the best practice strategies that she's learned. And so I have a driving question for us as well to help us get started with this project. And it is how can we become aware of the dangers of the loss of native species in our own backyards? And what actions can we take to protect those species? Okay. So um, thinking about that, um, what about native? What does that word mean? Ben? It's kind of like an animal that was born in a specific place and it knows what to do, how to do it, and where to do it. Okay, absolutely. So it started there or originated there, correct? Okay, so we wanna find out what is native or what was, what was here before we were outside, okay? And that would include plants, animals. What are some other things we've talked about this year besides plants and animals? Um, Jaden? Fungi. Fungi. What else could we look for? Yes. Bacteria. Bacteria. Mm, be a little bit hard to do that, but we could probably do that with maybe what kind of tool? Um, a microscope. Maybe. Okay. All right. Protist. Protist. Okay. All right. So, um, we need to think about, before we create our book, what would be some of the things that we would need to know? What are some questions that you have? Okay, what else might we need to know? Tamaya? What type of species it is. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, Jacob? How they affect us around us in our environment. Yes. Okay, so how do these creatures, plants, animals affect us? Okay. All right, Wyatt? How to tell if it's venomous or non-venomous. Okay, I believe we have that. What if, what if I put venomous here? That's a, that's a really good word, Wyatt. Last summer, I attended a Project Wild, and I'm very, uh, I really enjoyed that, and so that was one of the reasons that I started this unit. It was another inspiration to start the unit. And so um, I used some of the materials that I gained from that class, which was geared towards 9th through 12th graders, and I geared that down for my students. And um, they, we were able to uh, start with some maps, and they looked at some maps that were from like other places 
Uh, it started with present day, and then there were some uh, a map that was 50 years ago, and then a map that was 100 years ago. And so they compared those, and we basically just had those labeled map A, B, and C, and they looked at things such as uh, water sources, they looked at forest, they looked at, um, you know, what kind of development was there, like buildings, um, you know, man-made item, you know, things there. And we, they looked at those, they compared those, they were able to, we kind of walked them through that and they colored in so they could see it visually, uh, what, what occurred with that. And then we went into our activity that was more here, near and dear to us, um, we started with Unity Grove Elementary and what was here, you know, a few years ago. Today we're actually going to be looking at some Google Maps of our own area here. Okay, so I've pulled some from 1999 and some from present day. We're going to look at those. We're going to compare our actual land here at Unity Grove um, in 1999 to present day. And then we're also going to look at um, the Target Shopping Center, how many people have ever been there before? Okay, so we're going to look at that as well, like what was there before the Target Shopping Center was there. We're going to look at the Tussa Hall Reservoir, which is not too far down the street from us. And we're also going to look at the Lake Dow uh, Publix and see how, you know, what was there before. Okay, so we're going to look at those things and I'm going to give you a couple of things. I'm going to give you um, a template like this. And I'm also going to give you your um, Google Map, and you'll work in groups for this in just a minute. Co-teaching ideally is um, both teachers are teaching, and um, I feel like uh, that I work together very well with my co-teacher. Um, we do a variety of lessons where some days um, we're, we have centers where some of the students um, will rotate through me for a skill, they'll come to his center for a skill, then they have two independent centers as well, and um, they do a variety of things, so it may be differentiated in that they have a menu or something that um, maybe uh, they're not all working on the exact same thing, they're choosing, it may be a choice, or it may be something that, you know, we say, okay, you choose from these two or three activities when they're working independently. But we do a lot of parallel teaching as well. We may be teaching the same thing, but in two different rooms. Um, where, but we do a variety, so I don't always just have the special education students, and he doesn't always have just the regular education students. We mix them up so that they're exposed um, to different settings, and that they are flexibly grouped all the time. But to watch them working with the kids, if they bounce right off of each other, they, they use all the effective models of co-teaching within their classroom, you'll come in and one will be taking the lead, and then you might have them in small groups. So they just innately know what to do and um, just help our kids thrive. All right, so why is it important to know the difference between 1999 and now? What, what, what are we looking for? Lackey. Because a lot of stuff has changed and ah. it's like different now. Like somewhere I heard that they filled in a lake. Ah, yes. And we're going to talk about that when you get to the one for the Target shopping area. Take a close look at it. When I first moved here in 1998, there was a big beautiful lake there. You know what's there now, Kaylee? a big parking lot and a shopping center. So how did that affect that wildlife? That's why we're doing these. And we can really use these to uh, help educate the other students who are coming <coughs> after you how when buildings are built, schools and other things and homes, how does that affect the wildlife? Does it damage it? Do we need to control the amount of building that we have in a certain area? All right, let's start Phil. Have red? Um, can I see the red? Um, no, 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 no. The 
BioBlitz was um, very exciting. They loved that portion, and I feel like that they learned and they gained a lot because it was hands-on and it was all like all day. We took out, um, we pretty much devoted that day to being outside and discovering things and looking for signs of animals, l identifying trees, identifying plants, and they were. I think that it makes students more aware of their environment, and um, you know. Some people have been um, asked, you know, can you identify this tree? And they can't. And so I feel like this is something that students really need to know. They need to know what's around them and to be able to enjoy the environment and continue the outdoor movement. I have something very exciting to tell you today. We are going to experience a bio blitz where we're going outside to investigate our schoolyard and we're going to take our devices with us, like our iPads. We're gonna take a pencil and our journals, and we're going to be like real scientists today and find out what's out there. So, what kind of plant is this down here, guys? Oh, Jackson. Beauty berry. Beauty berry. And what kind of um, berries would be on there in the fall? Olivia? They're purple. They're purple. Can we think of any animal that might enjoy eating those? Jacob? Um, a a white-tailed deer. Absolutely. And if we look really close, it almost looks like they I'm took sure. a bite right there, maybe. Yeah. Our deer. Them was eating them. Mm-hmm. And then, Jaden, you pointed out this. What is this? Yes, and where would we, so everybody look around, around you and see if you can find the tree that fell off of. Where is that? Right here. Jackson, Jaden, right you see it? Yep, right here above us, absolutely. Look at those leaves. We've got how many lobes on the, on the leaves? Five. Five lobes. So it's definitely sweet gum. And a, hey, there's a birdhouse. Oh, okay. Let's look, let's look and see if there's any evidence of a bird in there. The bio blitz, um, even though we went outside and spent the entire day working on, you know, just identifying everything, uh, they, they had to write, they had to journal and put down where they, they found things and also it's, it's hands-on science. They were learning to be observant and they were learning um, the scientific method and questioning, well, why is this here or what is this? You know, how do I discover this? And so I think that um, hands-on science is the way to go and it makes it more real life for students. Yeah. Tamaya, did you find anything? Where'd that water strider go? He was over here where Jackson okay, is. Okay, so we can test this water with our water test kit that we have in the classroom and find out what kind of um, bacteria and organisms are living in there. Ooh. Oh. It is very tiny. I wonder what kind of critter that is. Do you can you count his legs? Uh, uh no. <laughs> How about Where is it? Ten thousand. Okay, so oh, he's stuck it. to the side of the jar. I'm wondering if it's some type of larva. Probably. All right, guys. Centipede. You saw a centipede today? Yes. What else did we see? I mean, we saw like okay. sweet gums. Sweet gums. Um, a sweet gum tree. Okay, what else do we see? When we came back in for the, from the BioBlitz, we did have, um, we did ask questions to try to get them to tell us, you know, the, the, all the things that they found, and we wanted to put those in categories. So when, one way to do that is just to, you know, kind of ask probing questions and use higher order thinking, and we try to do that higher order thinking um, so much in all of our lessons that we do. Um, because it really gets the kids thinking and it's not just a yes or no answer. It's more of, well, you know, can you, what about this? And it's more in depth and I think it really gets them thinking more. Okay, so we just got back inside from being outside on our schoolyard um, with our bio blitz. So let's talk about some of the things that we found and we're going to make a list up here to help us uh, when we get ready to do our book.
So I have some of the samples that you picked up uh, while we we're on the nature trail, and then we went to the stream in the back. Mm -hmm. Here was the water that came from the little stream on the nature trail. This is the water sample that came from the back field. So one of the things we want to examine is why is this orange and what is that in there and why is this so clear? Tamaya. Because the one that's orange, all the car oil can probably come down like to the nature trail and it can like make it like form different colors. Ah, very good. All right, yes. Probably the one that's dirtier has um, a little more pollution than the one in the field because the one in the field is not around a lot of things. The one um, that's dirty is around like a bunch of cars and a bunch of pollution. Okay, so if we're going to uh, teach other students about uh, the nature trail and the water and all the creatures there and everything, so we would need to come up a cat for a category to put this in. Would it be water quality, Ms. Hartfield, do you think? I think so. You like that? Is, yeah. is water quality important? Someone found some feathers. So what kind of category could we come up with for that? What is this an indication of, of something living on the nature trail down there? Let's try someone that hasn't answered. Destiny. What are feathers an indication of? What, what would feathers come from? Birds. Birds. So could we put a category for animals and then birds be in that? Because it's very important, isn't it? Okay. The first group that went with me down to the uh, nature, not to the nature trail, but to the back field, Thought they had found guacamole in the stream down there. Right, right, Tamaya? It wasn't guacamole. It was some type of algae. And it's still very green in here. So is algae a an animal or a plant? I think it would be like more of a plant because probably um, it's like something that grows on the Okay, all right, so just this itself we would think of as a plant, so we could have a, a category of plants. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and put algae there, okay? All right, so what are some other things that, that you found? What are some specific things that you found on the nature trail or while we were out doing the bio blitz? Jackson? I found some raccoon scat. That's an indication that the raccoon was, was, was there. So where would we put that? Do we need to put that under birds? So what category could we put a raccoon under, Jackson? Animals. Okay. What kind of animal? Um, raccoon. Okay. Can someone help Jackson out? We'll put raccoon up here, but we need to have a category for the raccoon. Um, this Jackson. Animal evidence. Okay, animal evidence. Okay, what, let's think about what kind of animal a raccoon is. Mia. A vertebrate? Okay, a vertebrate. Yeah, yeah. All right, we could do that. We could, but we're going to, does a, would a bird fit there too? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's put vertebrates up here. I guess what we're trying to think of, is it an amphibian? Is it a mammal? So would we have to have a category that's separate for mammal, mammals and amphibians? So what is a raccoon? And a, a mammal. All right, so we need to have a category for mammals there. All right, we're kind of starting to miss too. There's um, all of those unseen creatures that maybe we found when we lifted up a rock or something like that. What are those? You know, we're leaving out that one category. What were all the small things that we found? There's actually more of them than anything else. Mia, what are those little small things with six legs? What do we call those? Insects, very good. So do we need a category for insects? Raise your hand if you found an insect when you were out there. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you actually saw a mammal when you were out there. So actually we, we saw more insects than we saw anything else. So I think that's gonna be a very important category, right, Ms. Hartfield? So instead of vertebrate, what could we call those insects? What's that other word that we normally use? Uh, Matthew? Bugs. 
Um, okay, we need another word that has to do with the animal's backbone. Jackson? Invertebrate. Invertebrates, very good. So let's add that as well. Okay, and can someone name a few specific invertebrates that they found? Wyatt? Centipede. Centipede. Okay, anyone else? Um, Andon? A spider? Spider. We found insects and some spiders. Are spiders insects? Do they have six legs? Would they fit in that same category? Dorian? Spiders have eight legs. Okay, so then we could classify them in a little bit different way. Okay, so we could break this down even further on here for we have insects and then we have spiders and spiders are called, what are they classified? There's an arat, arat something. I can't quite remember that. It's on the tip of my tongue. Who remembers it? Jackson? An arachnid. An arachnid. So we could break that down even further there, couldn't we? So we have lots of categories up here. Are we missing any categories, Ms. Hartfield? Well, we have water quality, vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, mammals. I think there was one more because someone told me they found a brown mushroom. So what category would that be? What category would that be, Sean? Um, fungus. Okay. Do we say fungus? Or fungi. Got it. Once the students did their research uh, on their animal or plant um, or fungi, then they, uh, they, wrote, they wrote it on a paper first after they did the research, just kind of a rough draft. And then um, they put that on a Word document on the computer. And then from there, we, we moved it over to Blurb. And so they were able to add photographs that they took actually on site here. Okay, so we just finished our list of all of the things we found during the BioBlitz. And so now we're going to work on some research and finding out exactly what these animals and plants are. Um, what are some things that you think might be important for us, um, for people to know when they read about these animals? What do you think we should include? Jacob? Um, the animals like features and characteristics, its description and facts about it. Absolutely, because if they go to our nature trail, we want them to be able to identify that animal or plant, correct? Okay, all right, very good. What else should we include? The um, scientific name of the uncertain animal. I think that's important as well. You're right, Jackson, because, you know, sci real scientists, they use scientific names. And so we spend a lot of time being scientists outside and I think that, that that's definitely appropriate. Good job. What else, Olivia? Um, I think that it's habitat, like that way you would know where it's located at. Okay, good. So we would know where to find it. I'm going to give you a paper that has um, all of these things that we just discussed on it. And um, you guys have your research um, with your card attached with either the plant or animal or fungi name up there. And then you're going to look for those things within your, um, your printout, okay? So you'll look for those things, add them onto your paper using um, correct punctuation, um, complete sentences, things like that. And we talked about, we also talked about how we need to sort of put this into our own words, right? We don't want to, um, use anyone else's words, only our words. And then once you're finished with this, then we will get a computer and you will type this onto a Word document and then we're going to transfer that to our book, to our on blurb, okay? And then we'll add our pictures that you guys took also. I, I hold all the students to the same standard as far as learning that standard. Um, I may do things like um, highlighting or they may have to listen to things um, versus the regular education student is not. But they still have they still have to do the same research. They still are working on the book. Like they're all doing not the same thing, but they're getting there a different way. My my bar is set very high academically for all of these children. Uh, just because they're special ed or something like that, I don't I don't see that. So I set the bar very high. 
And Miss Hartfield comes in and kind of interjects to tell me, this is what this child needs. This is the, you know, you need to redo it this way or bring it down for a little bit of them. But I never actually lower the bar on what I expect of, of my students. Now that we've learned a lot about our um, schoolyard and the creatures that are there and how we can protect them, what have we done to answer our driving question? How can we become aware of the dangers of the loss of native species in our own backyard? And what actions do you think we can take? So what have we learned from doing this? Andon? You could write notes and send them, send them to people to make them or help them stop. Stop what? Um, destroying other animals' ha habitats. OK. All right. What else have we learned? Laura? To not interfere with their homes. Okay, so what can we do as a class from here to, um, to help people understand? We've made our book, um, we're going to share that, but what else, is there anything else that we can do to help protect those, those native species that we have out here in our schoolyard? Jackson? Um, we could stop using the pesticide or um, we can make a, well, one way we could plant like stuff so the animals can eat. Okay, all right. Okay, so you mentioned two things. Stop using pesticides and to plant things to help them. Good. All right, we've, we've learned a lot about being a conservationist and how, um, how we can help protect those animals and plants that we, um, we enjoy. So is there anything else that you can think of that we could do besides sharing our book? Dorian. Um, we can slow down the developing of making, like, building. Okay. And, and from this, how did we learn to not just you understand that, how do we get younger people to understand that? What is one way that we can get that information to them? Is it just through people like Ms. Hartfield, Mr. Hartfield, or could you do something about that? Yes, Jackson. Um, we could make, like, a website for, like, and put it on the school website that says, it says all about like what would happen if we went out there and destroyed everything. We put houses there, buildings there. Okay, all right. So, and we have that book that we'll have in the library. I think that writing with a purpose is really important for students and that um, being able to know who their audience is and be able to uh, and be able to reach that audience is important and it's authentic writing. So it, they definitely have this purpose and um, that gets the information out to others in the community, in the school community, as well as the um, communities of Locust Grove and McDonough. Um, and, and then on the internet as well, we, we have that huge global community now. So I think it really makes a difference for students because they, they can look at that and say, I did that, you know, this is something that um, my brothers and sisters will see, this is something my neighbors will see, um, and it, it kind of, it's, it's a real object that they produced, and I think that means a lot to them.